Okay. Good luck, guys. I'll see you later. We'll all see you later. Science and technology and innovation, these are indispensable in the modern economy, in the modern world. We held a meeting at the MSI and uh, we resolved among about six to eight of us, local members, first to form ASA Philippines so that we could continue to host uh, meetings here, but also to go on a massive campaign to um, uh, try to get support from uh, the national government uh, through the uh, legislative and executive uh, branches to invest more in science and technology. So um, it started with uh, a white paper, a position paper that we co-authored among uh, six of us, namely uh, Ernie Pernia, Cesar Salama, Rador Asansa, Toby Dairita Fataneo, and um, Alvin Colaba of De La Sal and myself. So Paase, historically, um, in the past uh, 10, 20 years for sure, uh, have been collaborating with um, our counterparts here in the Philippines at various universities. And a lot of these interactions probably started as peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, but thankfully, we have the Department of Science and Technology here in the Philippines, and they've come up with some really uh, helpful and uh, very impactful programs. That's actually enable ASEAN members that are based uh, in the United States and other parts of the world to actually come here and do extensive uh, research and academic partnerships and collaborations. Well, I think that um, one of the good things that uh, PAASE is doing is really trying to stay in touch with the researchers and the scientists here in the Philippines. So I think that is one of the good programs that they keep on supporting some of the initiatives of our researchers and scientists here in the country, trying to align also their, their assistance towards the, uh, the plans of the Philippine government. It's very important that the uh, PASA members and scientists based in the Philippines are continuously in contact so we will know the needs of you know, the Filipinos and opportunities that Filipinos can have to uh, do science with their PASA counterparts. So the, these interactions such as the conference that we're holding and the annual conferences that we have. The Philippines and the scientists there have a very unique perspective that adds to discoveries and inventions advancing uh, in general the field. These members, because they are part of an academy, it implies that they are productive. So they have publications, they have innovations, they have inventions, patents, and they have, um, you know, they have an impact on society. Okay, so uh, these are the people who can convince government, you know, invest more in science and technology, and that was really the gist of our paper, our position paper in 2000. And it is. Uh, uh, Ernie Pernia who said that R&D by nature is expensive and it is a public good. So it is important for the government to take the lead in uh, investing in R&D. To increase the economic growth potential of the country, we cannot continue to just uh, rely on traditional inputs into production as capital and labor. We also need to develop our expertise in science and technology and innovation so that we can come up with new systems 
new ways of doing things. I think that uh, science, uh, researchers, industry, and even the government is really like an ecosystem of knowledge. So I think it doesn't really matter if you're coming from a private institution or a public institution such as um, a state university. I think we all have a role to play to improve the research capabilities and scientific knowledge here in the country. I think it is about time for us um, to realize that one of our roles as academics, as researchers, as scientists, is to actually contribute to that global uh, body of knowledge. And the role of this uh, cooperation among these government agencies really is to be able to attract uh, science and technology global-based companies to set up shop here. And that is really key in terms of developing the science and technology innovation ecosystem in the country. Uh, particularly because there's that deep desire. And what PASE does and can do more of is to promote this relationship between its members. We really need to ratchet up the appreciation, the recognition of the importance of science and technology and innovation. And um, we are all um, trying to um, uh, attain what we call uh, the common good, the, the greater, higher, long-term good of the Filipino people. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening here in the US. Um, PASE members and colleagues, I would like to welcome you to the highlight of the meeting, the awarding of the Severino and PAS Co-Lectureship Award. Professor, uh, because this is our 40th anniversary, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Professor Ko. Professor Ko was one of the original co-founder of PASE. He completed his PhD thesis at Purdue University uh, with the title on the foundations of nonlinear thermal viscoelasticity. He moved to the University of Maryland where he founded the College of Engineering and served as associate dean in 1964. Professor Misko and early founders of PASE left a lasting legacy in the form of a generous endowment that provides a cash award to the winner. In 2000 at the Manila Shangri-La Hotel, this award was first established to recognize a PASE member with outstanding scientific and technological accomplishments. It was originally called the Founders Lectureship Awards in Science and Engineering. And the name was changed to the Severino and Pasco Lectureship Awards in Science and Engineering upon Professor Coe's death in 2004. And this year's awardee is Dr. Just Santos. PASE President Concepcion will read the certificate and Dr. Uh, Colaba will present the check for 1,000 US dollars. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is Gisela Concepcion. I am deeply honored to present this certificate of award to Dr. Just R. Santos, the 2020 Severino and Pasco Lectureship Awardee in Engineering. Given this day, 22 July, 2020, during the 40th past anniversary and 2020 APAMS, Manila, Philippines. Signed, Gisela P. Concepcion, PASA President 2020, Alvin Culaba, Chair, PASA Committee on Severina and PASCO Lectureship Awards 2020, attested by Lourdes Herald, PASA Secretary 2020. Congratulations, Dr. Juice Santos. Uh, thank you so much, Giselle. And the check of US dollar 1000. Juice, please, uh, the honors of receiving. Thank you. Thank you for sending me the checks and certificates.
the Severino and Paz Co. Lectureship Award in Engineering, Dr. Juiced Santos. We know him as Juiced, currently an Associate Professor at the Department of Engineering Management and Systems Engineering, George Washington University. His research interests lie at the intersection of systems engineering, disaster risk analysis, and economics. Professor Santos is one of the principal investigators in the 2018 Mitigation Saves, a highly cited report internationally. He's also one of the PIs in a multi-university National Science Foundation grant titled Organizing Decentralized Resilience in Critical Interdependent Infrastructure Systems and Processes. One of the key developers of the Inoperability Input-Output Model or IIM, which utilizes and transforms economic input-output accounts for disaster risk analysis applications, this model has been applied to hurricane impact analysis, multi-state electric power blackout, evaluation of renewable energy options, and most recently, in the analysis of mitigation measures in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. A two-time DOSD Balik scientist in 2012 and 2016, and as a visiting professor in 2015 in the Philippines, he had mentored Filipino graduate students notably, Dr. Joanna Resurrection and Dr. Krista Yu of UP Diliman and DLSU, respectively. Results of his research activities are documented in more than 100 peer-reviewed articles, including a highly cited article on the use of IIM, which appeared in an issue of Risk Analysis Journal in 2004, and subsequently earned him two Best Paper Awards from the Society for Risk Analysis. In 2009, he received the prestigious Leontief Memorial Prize from the International Input-Output Association. Juice grew up and spent his childhood and adolescent years in a low-income rural area in the Philippines. His mother was an elementary school teacher and single-handedly took care of him and his two siblings with her measly salary. His educational journey was centered on his vision to become a teacher, just like his mother. A scholar all throughout, his teaching career began at UP as an instructor in engineering sciences in 1994. He was an outstanding instructor awardee from the UP College of Engineering in 1996. In 1999, he pursued his PhD degree in systems engineering at the University of Virginia, where he received the Louis T. Rader Outstanding Graduate Student Award. He dedicates this co-lectureship award to his mother and first teacher, Emiliana Santos, who has inspired him to enter and pursue the indescribably beautiful world of teaching. Thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Alvin Colaba. I promise that I will turn on my video once uh, the presentation is over. So just uh, to make sure before I begin, uh, can everyone uh, see the slide that I have just uh, shared on the screen? Yes, Juice. Uh, thank you congratulations. so much. Uh, thank you so much. So um, again, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Colaba. Good morning and good evening to my Kababayans in the Philippines in the USA, and in other parts of the globe. I am most definitely honored to have been nominated and selected for this year's 2020 Severino and PASCO Award Lectureship in Engineering. So the title of my presentation is Systems Engineering Perspectives on Disaster Risk Management. I would certainly be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the following. First and foremost, the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering, especially the nominator, and the committee who eventually conferred me the co-award for engineering. Secondly, the National Science Foundation for funding my current and, and past grants and for supporting my interest with disasters, disaster risk management, that is. And finally, for the George Washington University, which I have considered my second home since 2009. 
on a personal level, I dedicate this presentation to my friends way back from my student days at the University of Philippines, Diliman. After all these years, our friendship has not dissipated. We still meet regularly via Zoom, and I ac actually can see some of them here attending uh, this Zoom presentation. And secondly, to my friends whom I have met via the karaoke app, Smule, <laughs> thank you for helping me maintain a mostly happy life while in isolation through your gift of music. Let's keep on singing, jamming, and dancing till the wee hours of the morning and be always deserving of the hashtag Locarets. To my research collaborators from De La Salle University, whom I truly consider friends, thank you for letting me immerse in productive research while enjoying your world-class friendship. Also, among these pictures are two of my PhD students whom I mentored at the George Washington University, who are now serving the nation Philippines through educating the future generation, one at UP Diliman and the other at De La Salle University, Manila. And finally, this is not a Photoshop picture. It really did happen. At the beginning of the year 2020, my family and I, we were together in 100 Islands in Alaminos, Pangasinan, and it was indeed a 100% quality family bonding moment. I'm so glad we did it before the pandemic became more complicated. So uh, this slide shows the outline of my talk. Many of you here know and have probably read some of my papers on input-output models. Input-output modeling has its roots from the field of economics. And its application in engineering has been one of the things that I started together with my PhD advisor way back in the early 2000s. To date, a Google search of inoperability input-output model collectively would reveal upwards of 20,000 hits. The inoperability input-output model, or IIM in short, has been featured in a myriad of disaster risk management applications, hence, it has been tremendously challenging for me to choose the two applications that I'd like to showcase in this presentation. In the end, I decided to choose the following two studies. Firstly, the mitigation save study, and secondly, the recently published papers on the COVID-19 pandemic. This presentation will then culminate with a Q&A portion. The next slide will present a quick overview of this presentation. With the rising likelihood and consequences from natural and human caused disasters, it is constructed to decompose the two primary types of loss associated with such events. The first is the so-called stock loss, which would include damage to human and man-made natural physical systems. The second is the so-called flow loss, which the literature also refers to business interruptions or BI in short. I know that Filipinos use BI for something else, but for this presentation, it stands for business interruptions. Business interruption, according to leading academic and insurance journals, has ranked among the costliest category of financial loss and also highest area of risk concern amongst economic sectors. In this series of slides, I will present a relatively quick lecture on input-output models and its uh, inoperability input-output model extensions. The Leontief IEO model or input-output model has been developed by Wassily Leontief in the 1930s for which he received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1973. Anyone who would like to know more and explore about the model should have a copy of the so-called Bible for Input-Output Analysis, which is the book by Miller and Blair, as shown at the bottom of this slide. This simplified generic two-sector economy has been lifted directly from Miller and Blair's book. The highlighted cells here show the inter-industry inter transactions or the endogenous consumptions from within the sectors themselves. Shown also is the column of final demands, which are the exogenous or external consumptions attributable to the households, government, and private firms. 
It also includes imports and exports. Note that the sum of the final demands give rise to the so-called gross domestic product or GDP, which I assume everyone is familiar with. This table also shows the value added row. Examples of value added include compensation to employees, machines, hardware, software, and others. Coincidentally, the sum of the value added also gives the gross domestic product, which uh, is actually a really beautiful mathematical thing that's going on here in, in the input-output table. When the shaded cells are normalized, it produces the so-called Leontief matrix A, which measures the strength of interdependencies across the sectors. In this slide, uh, furthermore, when we subtract the matrix A from the previous slide, we subtract it from a conformable identity matrix I and eventually take its inverse, this would generate the total requirements matrix denoted by L. When I was still a young instructor at the University of the Philippines, I used to teach linear algebra and never in my wildest dream to see a real world application of matrix inversion happening right before my and your eyes. So many nations across the globe, including the Philippines, publish the, the L matrix. Important policy insights can be gleaned from its column sums. For example, if you look at the value of 1.51, which is the column sum for column one, how do we interpret it? It means that for every $1 or one peso increase in the demand for sector one, the resulting increase in the production will be $1.51. The first column of L matrix shows how such total production increase is distributed across the two sectors, $1.25 for sector one and 0.26 cents for sector two. The same can be said for the second column sum, which is 1.45, which is the total output multiplier for sector two. Shown here is an actual L matrix for the United States, comprising of 15 sectors. Note that higher resolution L matrices can comprise of more than 400 sectors. To explain the column sums, this 15 sector aggregation shall suffice. Note that the sector here, look at the highlighted cells here in red. The sector with the highest column sum is the manufacturing sector which is S5. Its total multiplier is 2.48, which is quite high knowing that we are talking about magnitudes of billions of dollars. It is followed by agriculture denoted by S1 with a multiplier of 2.25. This is the reason why when stimulating the GDP for any economy, policymakers typically look, look for such key sectors, which in layman's terms, give the biggest bang for the buck. More advanced key sector analysis uses the concept of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which we will not cover in this lecture due to time constraints. This slide shows the IIM, which is a transformation of the IO model. Several key points need to be emphasized here. First, instead of the monetary units, we normalize the output in dollars using the inoperability metric. It is a variable between zero and one, which measures the proportion in which the sector is unable to satisfy its as-planned output. For example, a value of zero for inoperability is the ideal level, meaning to say the sector is flawlessly operating. And a value of one, another extreme value, it can be interpreted in such a way that the sector is completely out of commission or completely inoperable. The model also includes the resilience matrix, which represents the rate with which a sector is expected to bounce back to the pre-disaster level of production. The model also includes the impact on demand denoted by C. And finally, it has to be noted that this is a dynamic model that gives the level of inoperability in each time step of the recovery horizon. This slide demonstrates a two-sector stylized example 
that shows how a directly impacted sector, which in this case is sector two, the light blue curve. Reco uh, when uh, sector two, when we uh, take a look at it, it starts with a high level of inoperability until it recovers to a near zero inoperability. This slide also shows another sector, which I'd like to uh, show uh, to uh, request your attention to look at the dark blue curve here, which is sector one. This sector, sector one, which, which it wasn't uh, directly perturbed, but it became increasingly inoperable until it reaches its peak and then starts recovering. This graphic shows how the input output model, depending on the intensity of the impact on the sectors, which is the yellow, orange, and green shaded cells there, depending on the intensity of the impact on the sectors would create cascading impact on other sectors of the economy. In the United States, input output data can be accessed through the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is a division under the census um, Bureau, and also a private company called Implan. In the Philippines, I believe it's uh, the acronym is NCSB, the Na or NSCB, uh, National Statistical Coordination Board. So in this slide, I took the liberty of uh, sharing with you a screenshot of what you would expect when you go to the Bureau of Economic Analysis input output accounts. Input output data are publicly available through this website for free. This screenshot shows various resolutions of the model according to 15, 71, or 405 industry sector classifications. Having introduced the input output theory and data sources, we now delve into the first of the two applications that I prepared for tonight's presentation. The first one is the mitigation save study. The mitigation save study was funded by the National Institute for Building Sciences, and we worked actively with agencies like FEMA, housing and urban development, and others. The second version of mitigation saves, which uh, we uh, use the mnemonic MSV2, for which I was one of the investigators, produced an average benefit to cost ratio of six to one. The details for the different kinds of disaster are also shown in the table here uh, on the right panel of this slide. This was a rigorous study in which multiple academic and research institutions were involved. One of my favorite quotes from Benjamin, ben Benjamin Franklin, he once said, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And analogously, indeed in this study, we have proven that a dollar worth of mitigation investment translates to an average savings of about $6 relative to the unmitigated case. You might think that $6 is uh, small, but when we talk about billions of dollars of investments, this translates to $6 billion um, which I believe is the check that Paasa is going to issue to me. <laughs> the mitigation save study has been cited by a myriad of news articles, academic journals, and government agencies. The study was cited in the U.S. Congress Flood Risk Mitigation Act of 2018, as shown in this slide. So we are, the, we are shown as footnote number four here. So what did I do for this uh, mitigation save study? The methodology that I developed comprises of the two following phases. First, we looked at various building types and we mapped them according to the most relevant input output sectors with which they belong. This process will be explained on subsequent slides. And secondly, we simulated various resilience strategies to decrease the impact of a disaster. We simulated various types of building damage, superimposed the resilience strategies, and computed the resulting direct and indirect business interruptions. In the next few slides, I will take you to a quick journey of how we developed the methodology and uh, present you the key 
or the highlights of the results. This table shows the mapping between the input-output sectors and the building types. Once the damage was assessed in each building type, we ran the input-output model to estimate the business interruption losses, taking into consideration the implementation of resilience strategies. As you can see here, examples of building categories could range from residential, commercial, industrial, and as well as education and government. And uh, here we, you could see the mapping of uh, the input output sector categories and the different building types. There are 33 building types that we used according to the software called Hazus that I showed you from the previous slide. So you can see a one-to-one, -one, um, almost a seemingly one-to-one -one direct correspondence between the equivalent input-output sector and also the Hazus building occupancy class. Next, four types of resilient strategies were considered, namely production recapture, Examples of production recapture include overtime and extra shifts to catch up for lost production. Secondly, inventory. This includes stockpiles of production inputs to anticipate supply shortfalls. And then we also have relocation, which is moving production to other regions that are not impacted by a disaster. And finally, excess capacity, which refers to underutilized factories or equipment that can be invoked in times of disasters. For those attendees who are located in the DMV, DC, Maryland, uh, Virginia area, there's a storm brewing right now. So I'm gonna cross my fingers that um, I won't get disconnected. This actually makes me feel nostalgic. I'm go going out of my script. When I presented my final um, project, uh, for the Balik Science, science um, Scientist Program, and I know that uh, Raymond Tan is in the audience. There was a uh, like severe weather disturbance. His car got flooded, and every time I would make this presentation, it's so it, it seems that disasters uh, like to be um, keeping me company during these kinds of presentations. <laughs> So um, we're halfway there, so I'm sure I'll be able to go under the 40-minute allocation that was uh, given to me by Dr. Kulaba. This set of graphics published by a collaborator and former student, uh, Cash Barker, shows the efficacy of inventories in delaying, delaying the impact of disasters on various sectors. Without inventory, shown in red, the, the inoperability is expected to be significantly higher, especially at the beginning phases of a disaster. The blue curves show how inoperability and ultimately business interruptions can be significantly reduced by having stockpiles of inventories in anticipation of the arrival of a disaster. Shown in this plot is the concept of production recapture in the context of the so-called resilience triangle. The black curve shows the baseline inoperability trajectory, while the red curve shows the corresponding reduced level of inoperability due to production recapture. Again, production recapture includes overtime and extra shifts to recoup for lost uh, production. This table shows the recapture rate for various sectors of the economy. A quick example, I'd like to point your attention to the first value you can see in this table, uh, 0.75. The first value of 0.75 means that the agriculture sector is expected to recover 75% of its lost production for the first three months or first 90 days. The same interpretation can be said about the other values of the table shown in this slide. So some sectors are leveraging production recapture much better than others. As you can see, you can uh, see 0.98. And some sectors, like at the bottom here, government, 
sector is not typically good with production recapture. The production recapture is only 47%. The discussion of the remaining resilient strategies, I've mentioned relocation and excess capacity has been truncated in tonight's presentation in the interest of time. Now, let us proceed with the key results. This chart shows the business interruption loss for every $1 loss in each of the 33 building types. This chart assumes that resilience strategies are in place. Entertainment and resident, residential sectors are among the sectors that have high business interruption multipliers. And this result is quite intuitive. For example, it is difficult to recoup lost shows movies, or concerts for the entertainment sector. The concept of production recapture or inventory do not particularly apply to the entertainment sector. The same can be said for residential sectors, which include hotels and other temporary dwellings. This slide juxtaposes the result with the omission of the resilience strategies. Without resilience, shown in red, red bars, the picture drastically changes. The high business interruption multipliers would now include sectors such as food, drugs, agriculture, banks, professional services, and education. I, for one, can serve as a testament as a professor that I've already taught seemingly gazillions of online courses for the past uh, few weeks. And uh, that shows the resilience of uh, universities, just like the university that I am currently with, the George Washington University. So in summary, for the mitigation save study, we developed a methodology for linking building types with economic sectors, simulated direct damage scenarios, applied resilience tactics, and assessed business interruption multipliers for various building types. Such multipliers were integrated with other benefits of mitigation from different dimensions, including savings associated with adherence with building codes. So one of my best friends, she's now the same age as myself, retired, happily retired in Florida. And Florida is one of the states that adhere to the, strictly to the so-called I codes or international building codes. And she mentioned to me that if you buy a property that doesn't comply with the building codes, you will have to pay hefty insurance premiums. So um, also uh, uh, for business interruption, um, one of our collaborators also calculated the cost of loss of lives and also the incidence of the post-traumatic stress disorder. So we now move on to another case study, the second and final case study that I'll be presenting to you today or tonight uh, for people in the United States. In the next uh, set of slides, we will make a gear shift and proceed with the application of the inoperability input out output model to the COVID-19 pandemic. In recent weeks, I have published COVID-19 related papers in two journals. The left of the slide shows the front page of the paper published in Environment Systems and Decisions. The right panel of the slide shows uh, the one that is published in Sustainable Production and Consumption, or SPC. A special shout out to Professor Raymond Tan for connecting me with the editor-in-chief of SPC and providing ideas on how to frame the paper. To set the context for the case study, let us look at the flatten the curve concept as depicted in this slide. Flattening the curve is of extreme importance since it relieves the pressure of the constrained capacity of healthcare systems, essentially buying time before effective vaccines become available. Deadly pandemics have happened previously. One of the deadliest one, known as the 1918 Spanish flu, killed more than 50 million, again, I'd say it, 50 million people worldwide. And here in the United States, half a million people. And some studies even indicated in the United States, 
it could have been as high as 700,000 people due to lack of, lack of reporting or under-reporting. So fast forward into today, we are still struggling to manage the exponentially rising transmission of the COVID-19 pandemic caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Unlike other viral diseases that tend to take a break during warm weather months, this coronavirus currently is still on the upsurge. I'm scared, I have to admit it, I'm scared, but I remain hopeful. For example, the recent news about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, known as the AZD1222, has appeared to produce promising antibody response and could move to mass scale production by the end of this year. In the absence of vaccines, however, three categories of non-pharmaceutical interventions or NPIs can be implemented, namely containment, suppression, and mitigation. Containment is the approach of managing individual infections, essentially isolating active cases away from the general population. It is deemed effective only prior to community transmission or if the cases have been suppressed down to a manageable number to effectively implement quarantine and contact tracing, just like in the case of uh, New Zealand and Taiwan and Singapore. I don't know if it's a coincidence, but they are led by female leaders. Shout out to, the, um, to those fantastic women. Suppression refers to measures in which primary aim is to reduce the reproduction number. Are not. So for those of you who are familiar with the so-called SIR model, susceptible infected uh, recovered model, so there's a parameter there called R0, which measures the transmission rate. We'd like the, this uh, multiplier effect to be less than one. So suppression measures include quarantine, travel restrictions, and also business and school closures, among others. On the other hand, mitigation is the one that is actually most closely associated with the flatten the curve concept. The primary aim is to um, implement the so-called trinity of mitigation measures. In the papers that I have published, I, ha I have coined the phrase trinity of mitigation measures that include physical distancing, face covering, and hand hyg hygiene. Some people to date still use social distancing, but I believe in my heart that it should be physical distancing because we could still be socially connected via social media, just like what we're doing today. So this slide shows the Johns Hopkins University COVID-19 dashboard. As of yesterday, so Dr. Kulaba um, requested me to submit my slide one day ahead of time. So I'm not sure to what extent the data has already changed from yesterday to today. So this slide was from yesterday. As of yesterday, there were a total of 14.5 million recorded cases and over 600,000 deaths globally. United States of America continues to lead the cases with a very big margin followed by Brazil. I hope you could see the irony here. United States is only about 4% of the world population but accounts for a staggering 25%, I repeat, 25% of the recorded cases. Makes me sad. The approach in this case study is to use epidemic curves or epi curves published by the CDC. In particular, we utilize the weekly attack rates, which tell the number of active cases expressed as a proportion of the population. Given the attack rates, we can customize the so-called sector-specific sector specific attack rates that consider the resiliency of each sector, notably its workforce. Workforce is a critical production factor. It is the heartbeat of any sector and any society. I have a published a paper with my collaborator, collaborators from De La Salle University in which we uh, came up with the acronym um, wait, which uh, 
gives the dimensions for resilience. Weight includes workforce, the first uh, of the acronym, economy, infrastructure, geography, hierarchy, and temporal or time dimensions. Workforce debilitating events such as the COVID-19 pandemic can have adverse effects on the output, production output of any sectors. Some sectors are impacted more, some less. For example, sectors that have moved to online platforms were able to avoid significant losses. Some sectors have found creative ways to continue their operations, such as in the case of grocery and food delivery. Essential sectors such as hospitals, meat and food processing plants and stores continue to operate. Hopefully, their workforce are provided with effective PPEs or personal protective equipment. In this slide, we show the assumed parameters for the four scenarios considered in the study. Here, we could see a baseline scenario with a peak attack rate of 50% over a course of the 60-day horizon. The parameters for mitigation and suppression scenarios are also shown. Longer in duration, but significantly lower attack rates. Finally, the last column of this table, scenario four, is a re-simulation of the suppression scenario, taking into account sector-specific workforce resilience. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see some examples like continuity strategies, teleworking, transitioning service to online platform, curbside pickup or delivery for stores and restaurants. So this series of charts show the resulting economic losses across the four scenarios. Each chart shows the most affected sectors. Even a cursory glance at the results appears to indicate the efficacy of mitigation and suppression measures in flattening the curve. So uh, I will show you a more aggregated view uh, juxtaposing all of the four scenarios in a few slides from now. Several observations could be made. The loss incurred in each sector is a function of both the magnitude of its GDP as well as its reliance on labor. The simulation also reveals the heavily impacted sectors that are among the highest contributors to the GDP, including government, trade, and construction. The results also appear to indicate profound impacts on labor-dependent sectors, such as service, hospitals, food, and labor-dependent management companies. This chart aggregates the losses for all sectors in each of the four scenarios. It shows the extent to which mitigation and suppression measures could effectively flatten the curve. So for those who are watching the news right before we started this uh, um, virtual presentation, I would surmise that some of you saw the study for the United States that strongly said that if 90% of the population in the United States would uh, practice the trinity of mitigation, what's the trinity again? Physical distancing, hand hygiene, and the controversial mask, then the, the wave will be flattened and will actually be uh, within the control just like what's happening in Taiwan, New Zealand as well as uh, Singapore and also for some, to some extent Japan. So given the simulation of the four scenarios, the cumulative economic losses were computed showing a stark contrast and potential savings realizable with the implementation of suppression and mitigation measures. The losses were also expressed as a percentage of the GDP. The data here shown on this slide is for the United States. A recent article by Correa and others looked at the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic and concluded that cities that implemented stricter measure, uh, measures generally realized higher employment rates several years after the pandemic. Nonetheless, in the implementation of mitigation and suppression measures, Policymakers and government officials need to be cognizant of the negative side effects of such measures. These side effects include decreased public morale, 
mental health, and substance abuse. Studies have also revealed the unfortunate disparity of effects of the pandemic across different income, income groups and different socioeconomic groups. In summary, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the significant gaps in current disaster risk management frameworks. Challenges include political resistance to science. I'd like to repeat it, political resistance to science and mismanagement of some regions and nations, notably the logistical issues surrounding with healthcare resource optimization and case management. To conclude, let me show you this graphic. As I read off directly from the slide, I would like to encourage you to make your own personal reflections, which could, which could also be a good segue towards the Q&A portion. So this slide says, there were three different waves of illness during the 1918 pandemic, starting in March 1918, and subsiding by summer of 1919. The pandemic peaked in the US during the second wave, again, second wave in the fall of 1918. This highly fatal second wave was responsible for most of the US deaths attributed to this pandemic. Thank you so much for your attendance and attention. I hope that in this presentation, I am able to show you my systems engineering and economic perspectives on disaster risk management. Quoting the famous George Box from statistics, all models are wrong, but some are useful. One of my favorite quotes in the world. Again, that's all models are wrong, but some are useful. Huge thanks to my students, some of whom are here, and research collaborators who continue to have faith on the usability of the inoperability input-output model. I now relinquish the floor to the esteemed Dr. Alvin Colaba to moderate the Q&A portion. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Juice. Indeed, a well-deserved uh, call lectureship awardee for this year in the field of engineering. Um, your talk uh, opens up uh, many things. Now, certainly in the Philippines, we need sound and rigorous analytical tools uh, to provide disaster planning and management insights, especially for our policymakers. So to our participants uh, here in our virtual meeting in Zoom and those who are uh, logged into our YouTube uh, channel, uh, thank you for uh, gracing this uh, plenary session on call lectureship word. Uh, we are going to... Uh, proceed with a question and answer for this special session uh, for Dr. Just, uh, you know, Santos. Um, we have uh, one question from uh, Dr. Raymond uh, Tan. Can we uh, show that question, please? Okay, uh, from Raymond uh, Tan. Okay, uh, okay, let's take the question from Hill Mendoza. Um, for the mitigation case study, I have a two-part question. Number one, it seems to me that the inoperability metric is the sole basis for analyzing impacts. No mention about economic loss, a key component of the IO model. Second, the inoperability measure is a key variable in the model. I understand it is based on some target, ideal, planned level. Why not based on actually achievable level? So it is between zero to one because it is based on the target level. How is this target level determined or estimated? Just two questions for you from Hill. So I'll answer uh, the first question first. Inoperability is indeed the key metric for um, presenting the results, but actually economic loss is there. It might have just been buried with a 40 minute presentation. When I presented the 
GDP results and also those uh, trajectory of economic losses, those waves for the four scenarios, the y-axis are actually in monetary values. So it's actually um, a straightforward computation. Once we are able to compute the inoperability for a particular economic sector, we simply multiply it with the ideal GDP or the production output rather for that sector, which will give the economic loss equivalent of the inoperability. So for the second question, uh, it is uh, based on target or ideal or as planned level. You are correct. And the target level is assumed to be a forecast of the previous year's GDP. So as what we have seen in the uh, coronavirus pandemic, not just in the United States, but across the globe, there has been a um, clear reduction in the GDP because of business closures and the impact of mitigation measures. So um, the ideal level is pegged from let's say uh, first quarter GDP or second quarter GDP from previous years. And I lost uh, the copy of the, uh, like uh, there was a PowerPoint slide there and I don't know if I have already optimally answered the question. So the rejoinder to the first question, I think I've already answered it. So the target level is estimated from previous years GDP levels. So in, in sum, economic loss values are directly computable from the inoperability metrics. Uh, thank you, uh, Juice. Uh, let me take you to this uh, to the next question from uh, Michael uh, Romentilia. Congrats, Juice. I hope the mitigation study could be extended to Philippines setting in this regard. Would multiple disasters in succession, uh, succession was considered in the simulation and which of the resilience tactics has the largest impact in the rebound effect? So before I answer that question, uh, I'm glad to uh, see uh, Dr. Permentilia in the audience and um, for those who don't know it, one of the most famous uh, um, articles published by the medium, it's titled, um, correct me if I'm wrong, like Hammer, something like that. I'm blanking out because I'm nervous. But uh, Dr. Promentilia was the one who uh, single-handedly translated that seminal article by Tomas Pueyo. You would see Tomas Pueyo constantly on CNN. So Dr. Promentilia translated in, in Filipino uh, version. So to answer uh, Dr. Permentilia's question, when I was writing the paper, never in my uh, imagination that, uh, that the United States will have its uh, spike right now, the assumption was a 60-day epidemic curve, which was uh, the prediction if the, the mitigation measures were religiously um, implemented by by the White House and also the population. But unfortunately, uh, I don't want to go to the politics of this, but since the people here are believers of science, so um, try to imagine the epidemic curve to have been a smooth unimodal function. But in the case of the United States, it's currently a bimodal function. So to answer Dr. Permentilia's question, in the scenario which was simplified enough, I didn't take into consideration this succession of events. And I myself was surprised with the by, by modality. It's, it's not even the second wave yet, but you could see the bimodal nature, which if I were to re-simulate the scenario, I could have uh, considered two peak attack rates for the study. And I hope um, I'm able to answer your question, Dr. Permentilia. And of course, uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Just. Of course, thank this uh, study, this study, just quickly, this study could be uh, implemented also in the Philippines, uh, Dr. Krista Yu, and also um, the DLSU economists are uh, familiar with input-output model and also computable general equilibrium. Thank you, Just. We haven't uh, received questions on the YouTube, uh, you know, listeners. Um, let me uh, read the question from Raymond Tan. Thanks, Juice, for your excellent talk and congrats on a well-deserved recognition. My question is whether permanent BI losses, uh, such as from bankruptcies, 
due to COVID-19 are functionally equivalent to physical damage to capital goods from disasters such as hurricanes, earthquakes, and others? That's an ex excellent question. And um, I still have to process the question outside of this presentation. But my quick answer right now is um, perhaps uh, permanent losses to firms and companies that cannot be uh, recovered after the pandemic could be, uh, we could do, uh, draw a parallelism uh, with capital losses or the stock losses that I mentioned in one of the slides. Um, in order to uh, forecast the future economic losses until such uh, equivalent building occupancy classes associated with this economic sectors could be revived in the future. So uh, humbly, this is an excellent question and a tough one and I don't have a ready-made answer right now. Thank you, Just uh, Raymond, it has to wait. Uh, maybe an opportunity for further uh, uh, collaborative uh, work. Some uh, uh, just comments from Edsel Pena, our Vice President of Paase. Congrats, Juice, for your co-award and for a very nice talk. Also, for providing our Paase colleagues a glimpse of the importance of mathematics, linear algebra, and for quoting George Box. <laughs> okay. Um, there is a, an additional uh, uh, suggestion from Hill Mendoza, as he has earlier actually asked uh, his question. Um, the second study, uh, which focuses on economic loss, which was missing in the first case study. Um, I'm wondering and recommend that in both case studies, both economic loss and inoperability metric uh, should be used. Mm -hmm. So just, uh, you know, a comment. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, anyway, he sends his uh, congratulations uh, to you just from Hill Mendoza. Um, we still have a couple of uh, minutes, about three to five minutes uh, to accommodate more questions. If there are questions from the YouTube uh, listeners, you know, uh, from our audience here in Zoom, you are most welcome, you know, to uh, speak now. Okay, so uh, it seems that uh, everyone's, uh, you know, satisfied, uh, their appetite, uh, you know, is full. Uh, just uh, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Indeed, uh, it is uh, worth, uh, you know, more than just a thousand US dollars, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations again. And let's give uh, Dr. Juice Santos, our 2020 co-lectorship awardee in engineering, a virtual round of applause. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Just. Of course, I know you will be holding on uh, in this session as we proceed uh, with uh, our uh, uh, two additional talks from, uh, you know, our distinguished uh, speakers, which I will be introducing in a minute. Okay. Um, we have here our next uh, speaker to uh, talk on process graphs, past, present, and future. Perhaps we, we can see him uh, live. Uh, Raymond, where are you? Oh, there. There you are. Here. So, okay. Good morning. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Raymond. Uh, good morning. Let me just introduce our speaker. Raymond Artan is a professor of chemical engineering, university fellow, and current vice chancellor for research and innovation of De La Salle University. 
and an academician of the Philippine National Academy of Science and Technology. His main research interest is the development of mathematical models for sustainable industrial systems. He has more than 380 publications with an H index of 43 in the Scopus database and ranks among the top researchers in the world in the subject areas of process integration or PI and process systems engineering or PSE based on Google Scholar citations. He received his BS, MS in chemical engineering and PhD in mechanical engineering from De La Salle University. He's the editor-in-chief of Process Integration and Optimization for Sustainability of Springer Nature, subject editor of Sustainable Production and Consumption from LCBA and ICME, associate editor of Cleaner Engineering and Technology, also from LCBA, and an editorial board member of Clean Technologies and Environmental Policy from Springer Nature. He's the author of the books, Process Integration Approaches, in Planning Carbon Management Networks from the CRC Press and Input-Output Models for Sustainable Industrial Systems from Springer Nature and editor of the books Recent Advances in Sustainable Process Design and Optimization from Wiley and Process Design Strategies for Biomass Conversion Systems from World Scientific. He has received multiple scientific awards from government and scientific organizations in the Philippines and also the Paase 2017 Co-Lectorship Awardee in Engineering. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, to speak on the process graphs, past, present, and future, Dr. Raymond R. Tan. Thanks very much, Alvin. Uh, good morning, Paase colleagues. It's an honor to be introduced by your former PhD advisor, and we, Alvin and I, go back a long way. However, since I have developing country internet connectivity, we thought it would be better to use a pre-recorded slideshow, and then I'll get back to the audience for the Q&A. So can we request the, the conference team to play? OK. Uh, thank you, Raymond. Uh, there is a quick plug, and here it is. Good morning. My name is Raymond Tan. I'm Professor of Chemical Engineering at De La Salle University, and my talk today is entitled Process Graphs, Past, Present, and Future. The talk is based partly on a perspective paper that I wrote with colleagues from Hungary, the Philippines, and Malaysia, and which was published last year in Current Opinion in Chemical Engineering. The main topic of my talk is the process graph or p-graph framework and we'll look at the past, present, and future of this computing framework. Let's begin with the past. P-graph was originally developed in the context of chemical engineering, which is dedicated to the problem of mass production of chemicals from various raw materials using a network of chemical and physical processes that are put in sequence as shown on screen. The main design problem for chemical engineers is to put together technologies to allow conversion of raw materials into marketable products and to do it in a profitable way. Within chemical engineering, there's a branch known as process systems engineering, which is dedicated to the development and use of various mathematical and computer tools for engineering problems. And PGRAPH is one of these tools. This is a graph theoretic framework to address what is known as the process network synthesis or PNS problem. And was developed by Friedler and Fan for the purpose of developing a network of operations that can be translated eventually into an actual industrial plant out of technology building blocks. At the heart of the p-graph methodology is a bipartite graph consisting of n-type nodes 
to represent streams of material or energy and O-type nodes to represent processes or operations which convert inputs into outputs. The PGRAPH framework begins with five actions that act as foundation for the development of key algorithms that comprise this methodology. The main algorithms are as follows. Maximal structure generation, or MSG, is the algorithm which assembles process building blocks rigorously into what you may think of as a master network formerly known as a maximal structure. And uh, this maximal structure has an important feature in that it contains within it all possible designs that uh, can eventually be developed for a given problem. The second algorithm is solution structure generation, or SSG. This is an enumeration algorithm which can identify all combinatorially or structurally feasible subsets of the maximal structure and each of these solution structures represents a design alternative which can be evaluated and explored by engineers for consideration to be built into an actual plan. The third algorithm is accelerated branch and bound, or ABB, which is an algorithm which can economically evaluate the options available using SSG logic to have a very fast optimization by elimination of infeasible and redundant solutions. So let's have a look at a classical problem from PGRAPH literature. In this case, our problem is to design a plant to produce A using raw materials E, G, J, K, and L, and using seven processes which are shown in conventional block diagram form at the top of the screen and shown in PGRAPH form in the inset at the bottom of the screen. The first problem we have is to assemble these building blocks into a master network or the so-called maximal structure which would produce product A using any of the raw materials which are available on the market. Application of MSG gives us the following structure on the left hand side of the screen and this is an algorithmically related, or rather algorithmically generated structure and uh, not generated based on human knowledge which may have gaps and thus may result in human error. So that's an important feature. The next step now is out of this maximal structure we need to explore all possible combinatorially feasible structures which we can then further evaluate in the design problem. And you would initially think that with seven component processes you would have two raised to seven or 128 alternatives to explore. But if we use SSG we can initially identify these seven structures. We can identify another seven structures and eventually upon complete enumeration we've identified 19 combinatorially feasible structures each of which is a subset of the maximal structure and each of which is a candidate plant design. So you would observe that we've gone from 128 alternatives down to 19 which is about an order of magnitude reduction in the search space. For much larger problems as we've seen in the PGRAPH literature the scaling down of the search space could be multiple orders of magnitude a million fold or more reduction. The capability to enumerate all combinatorially feasible structures that has been shown can have very useful features because the machine generated set of options can often be counterintuitive or surprising. In other words, these are designs that a typical engineer drawing from his or her background knowledge may not be able to imagine and uh, thus uh, relying purely on human expertise may miss some important solutions which have interesting properties such as higher energy efficiency or lower carbon footprint. So this is one of the important characteristics of using the PGRAPH methodology. p 
graph software has evolved over multiple generations. The most accessible one is hosted by the University of Pannonia in Hungary and is accessible via pgraph.org uh, and uh, is open access. Now let me talk about my work using pgraph for conventional engineering problems, specifically thermal and energy engineering problems. I've done extensive work on what are known as polygeneration systems. This is a term which dates back to a 40-year-old NASA document, and it means the production of electricity along with other side products, such as steam, chilled water, hydrogen, chemicals, and so on and so forth. And the logic behind polygeneration is that it is able to produce the products at a higher level of efficiency and lower emissions than having separate unintegrated processes that produce them in the same quantities. In 2014, I developed with some colleagues a PGRAPH model for optimizing abnormal operations in a polygeneration plant. The abnormal operations can occur, for example, when we have to shut down parts of the plant for repair or maintenance while keeping the rest of the plant running and trying to find the operating state that minimizes economic losses while repairs are being done. More recently, I've done work on PGRAPH models which allow for design of flexible plants. These are plants that are able to adjust operating states to account for seasonal product demand. And uh, this is an important feature because very often the assumption made is that the plant and its various components simply run at maximum capacity 24-7. And in real life, of course, that doesn't happen because plant operations are subject to the market variations. A couple of years ago, I published a couple of papers that integrate fuzzy set theory with process graphs in order to account for what are known as uh, soft constraints. In optimization, normally constraints are deterministic in the sense that if you set a limit of, say, 100, even a tiny violation of this constraint, if you go to 100.1, that is considered immediately an infeasible solution and thus is eliminated from further consideration. Soft constraints allow for small degrees of user-specified violations of such limits and are important because by doing so, you're able to come up with much more robust solutions. And we did this for design of polygeneration plants in 2017-2018. Earlier this year, we took the same fuzzy PGRAPH methodology and extended it not for the design problem, but for the operation problem. And we took the case of a polygeneration plant with a hydroelectric prime mover in a hypothetical off-grid remote community, and we considered how such a plant should be operated if there's a drought and the, the river flow rate is reduced. And in such cases, depending on the extent or severity of the drought, you may have to switch off parts of the plant and you would have to adjust the operating state of those which remain in operation. All the while, trying to maintain the outputs that are required by this remote village by way of electricity, drinking water, and ice for refrigeration needs. Next, I'll talk about PGRAPH future. Process graph has been used for a large range of network type problems, ranging in scale from at the smallest of the molecular scale. Chemical reactions have been modeled using PGRAPH. And at the opposite extreme, on a grand scale, entire economic systems of entire countries have also been represented in PGRAPH form. And this slide shows some of the past and the prospective work for which PGRAPH may be applied, which I discussed in a paper two years ago. Some of the work that I've done on non-engineering applications of PGRAPH include a 2015 paper in the Journal of Cleaner Production, where we use PGRAPH to represent the economy of an entire country, the Philippines in this case. 
the basis of this modeling approach is what is known in economics as the input-output model, which represents economic sectors as a process that produces a unique output while requiring specific inputs from other sectors. Input-output analysis also assembles such processes or sectors into a, an economic network as shown at the bottom of the screen. And the economic network is a stylized representation of the real economy and allows for the analysis of, among other things, uh, you could forecast the effects of natural disasters or changes in technology and so on. And we showed that uh, by using PGRAPH in conjunction with input-output analysis, optimization can be done to minimize the adverse effects of uh, disasters and loss of natural resources. In late 2019 until earlier this year, I worked with some colleagues on the use of PGRAPH to represent ecosystem networks, which are graphical representations of ecosystems where relationships among species can be mapped out, whether these are trophic relationships where one species eats the other, or these are, for example, mutualistic or competitive relationships. These can be mapped in PGRAPH form. And what we showed in this paper, which we expect to be published shortly, is that we can use PGRAPH to identify critical components of the ecosystem and uh, in the context of ecosystem management, that kind of information is useful because it can allow resources to be prioritized for the more important parts of the ecosystem. Another recent work which uh, applies PGRAPH to a, a novel network is the use of PGRAPH for decision networks. In this work, which you may consider bordering on machine learning, we showed that PGRAPH can estimate or approximate the thought process of a human. So the input into the model is how a human expert ranks a small set of alternatives. And that is just ordinal information for four or five alternatives. And uh, the human expert need not specify his or her thought processes in ranking these alternatives. We showed that we can use PGRAPH to approximate those thought processes via a decision model which can then be used to generalize the expertise of the human who, who just provided quick inputs by way of ordinal information. Now I go to my conclusions. PGRAPH is important because number one, network structure and discrete choices across network structure typically has a stronger influence on system performance as compared to variations of performance within a given network structure. Thus, the capability to enumerate these networks is very important in many problems. This enumeration capability is important for problem analysis by engineers and analysts, and also important for decision support, because typically the analysts would not be the final decision makers, but they would need to convince their superiors, for example, CEOs of corporations or politicians who make uh, policies for entire cities or countries. The arguments can be made much more persuasive by showing that different alternatives have been explored to the fullest extent. In conclusion, PGRAPH is a powerful computational framework for solving PNS and PNS-like problems. And even though this uh, framework was originally developed as a chemical engineering tool, it has been shown in recent work, including some of mine, that it is also useful for what are known as generalized process networks, both within and outside of engineering applications. I'd like to end by acknowledging some colleagues, and especially Professor Friedler, the father of PGRAPH himself. Uh, Professor Kathleen Aviso has been co-author of most of my PGRAPH work, and Professor Hong Lung Lam, who introduced me to PGRAPH uh, close to a decade ago. So thanks to all three of you. And a final quick plug, I'm involved in the management 
of these four journals, we accept uh, contributions where there are computational and sustainability aspects of uh, engineering work. And in conclusion, I'll be happy to take questions now, or you may email me for queries after today's talk. Thank you once again. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Raymond, for that uh, excellent talk. Uh, you did, uh, you know, presented some new, you know, uh, analytical tools uh, to deal, especially with, uh, you know, green uh, engineering problems. So thank you uh, for that. Indeed, uh, you have come a long way. You used to have hair before. Uh, I'm I'm not party to that. <laughs> so sorry. Anyway, we are going to take uh, the questions uh, uh, later on uh, when we finish. Uh, you know the next talk by another distinguished uh, you know speaker. Um, so the uh, second talk. Uh, following uh, Raymond's uh, uh, talk is uh, on developing online science labs. So let me uh, introduce our speaker. Romel Gomez is a professor and associate chair for undergraduate education of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Maryland College Park, uh, Maryland, USA. He earned his PhD from the University of Maryland, MS from Wayne State University, and BS from the University of Philippines, all in physics. Dr. Gomez's research interests are in the broad areas of micromagnetism, biosensing, and nanotechnology. He has co-authored over 120 peer-reviewed publications, several book chapters, a book and holds three US patents and one worldwide patent. Dr. Gomez also teaches engineering design, circuits, microelectronics, electromagnetics, quantum theory, and magnetic technology at the undergraduate and graduate levels. As the Associate Chair for Undergraduate Education, Dr. Gomez has helped strengthen the ECE curriculum in communications, embedded systems, cybersecurity and power, which elevated the ECE ranking to 20th in the US, according to US News and World Reports. He is the architect of modern courses spanning freshman introductory to senior capstone design courses. He's also the lead proponent and founding director of the new Bachelor of Science in Embedded Systems and the Internet of Things under the University System of Maryland Higher Education. Dr. Gomez awards include the George Corcoran Award for Engineering Education, the National Science Foundation Career Award, the Clark School of Engineering Kent Faculty Teaching Award, the Keystone Professorship, Professorship, the Clark School Faculty Service Award, the Poole and Kent Senior Faculty Teaching Award, the Field Dev Excellence Award in Science and Technology. It was also recognized the 2015 UP Alumni Association Distinguished Alumni Award in Science and Technology from the University of the Philippines. And in 2018, elected as a corresponding member of the National Academy of Science uh, and Technology of the Philippines. Also, the Paase 2008 Co-Lectureship Awardee in Engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Romel Gomez. Thank you very much, uh, Alvin. Uh, it's really great pleasure. And I hope this works because we're gonna make this really highly interactive. So if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen. And, uh, and I just wanted to know if you guys can actually see it. Could you just give me like a plan, like some indication that you can see that this is just basically two sites? Yes. Good, yes. can you see that? Okay, thank yes, you. Mel. So, so this is kind of the, the, the point of this talk. Uh, this is, these are live, uh, you can play with it later on, but essentially this is what we're gonna be talking about today. And so I know it's uh, probably a lot, if you want, you can, 
you can open the sites up now or save them later. But please keep in mind these two sites. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, first of all, uh, for this wonderful um, opportunity to give a talk. Thank you, Alvin, for a nice introduction. And, uh, and it is really my pleasure to report to you what I, be, what is, what, uh, I believe is a work in progress with the hopes that uh, it will, this project will alleviate the problem in offering laboratory courses damaged by COVID, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, uh, uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has created all sorts of difficulties for everybody, most importantly, the university, right? So as educators, we understand the value of, of labs. In fact, failure to deliver labs can be existential threat to brick and mortar institutions. You would come to think of it. Why would you go to expensive traditional schools if everything were taught online anyway. Coursera, uh, edX, other MOOCs are probably good enough. Uh, and it is also clear, absolutely clear, that the failure to provide hands-on experience is a death blow to the STEM field, particularly engineering. So we know this. And so like many other schools in the United States, we at College Park are struggling to find ways to deliver labs that are subject to social distancing guidelines. But I must confess, it has been very, very hard. Using these uh, suggested, let's do a little math here. Using the suggested six feet of distance between, uh, between students, you estimate, we can estimate very clearly, you know, pi r squared times 25 students, just 25 students in a lab. That will require more than 300 square meters of space. That is, that is as big as a typical uh, movie theater. Now, we don't have too many rooms like that at College Park, let alone labs. So what did we do? So what do people do? Well, there are a lot of band-aid solutions to the problem. You know. Some put plastic barriers between stations, probably similar to the Egypt or the, the jeepneys that we have over there sometimes. Uh, uh, some uh, even uh, suggested to offer uh, to extend university hours from early morning down to late at night and even weekends. But you know, it's going to cost money because those places have to be staffed that long. And then some courses convert labs, what they call labs, into simulations. Well, there's really nothing wrong with simulations per se, but simulation is as good as a thought experiment. The results are as good as what you have in mind, and it is really not real. So a lot of these solutions are probably okay, but it is clearly unacceptable in the long run. So what we, didn't, what we need is a long-term sustainable solution that provide even more training to the students. And so faced with this, we embarked on a little ambitious program, a little ambitious program to develop labs that students can perform at home using only a laptop or a smart device. Now, this, I believe, is a paradigm shift and a clear departure from the norm. I suspect that something like this would probably be uh, more ubiquitous uh, in the near future, COVID-19 with COVID-19 or not. So this is the backdrop. This is the backdrop of what I'd like to tell you uh, today. So the, the inspiration is coming from the so-called Industry 4.0 or the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Uh, in particular, it's also uh, uh, the, the topic of digital twins. So what is it? Well, in the Fourth Industrial Revolution, data from machines in factories are, readily, are made rel readily available on the cloud, which can be accessed anywhere from any smart device. So in this scenario, all of the vital signs of the equipment uh, Dr. Tan's uh, uh, processing was a very complicated one. Uh, they could actually be monitored no matter how complex a system. It could be monitored, reported, stored, analyzed digitally. And of course, when you have all of that, you can do all sorts of uh, uh, machine learning uh, algorithms that you want. Nevertheless, one way of thinking about this is that the real factory, therefore, has a twin. It's a digital twin. Its physical operation is mimicked in the digital world 
with extraordinary fidelity. That's Industry 4.0. Now, why can't we do this? I mean, why don't we uh, steal somebody else's good idea? So why can't we do something like this? And so we can bring experiments from students from their homes to the lab. So we can apply this concept, develop a system that, uh, that, uh, that all they need, that the students, all, all the students need are, are laptops. Now, Industry 4.0 made huge investments in the digital twins technology, and we can leverage them in our application. They put a lot of money into it, mostly in the developers, the system developers, the hardware designers, and the systems integrators. They all were paid big bucks for this. Now, well, that's not our problem. After all, we are in a university and we are brimming with talent to accomplish this mission. And so I said, okay, well, let, let's do something like this now. So I assembled a team of uh, students. Uh, there were people who, uh, who uh, when I announced it, there's 35 students, many, many very good students of which I had a hard time, but eventually I settled on seven. And I'd like to introduce them uh, uh, one at a time. Let's see if it works. Hello, my name is Kang. I'm an undergrad electrical engineering major at the University of Maryland. And I've been put in charge of the hardware side of things, uh, connecting everything. Um, and I help with a little bit of code. And uh, my specific interests are analog electronics. Hi, I'm Michael Connolly. I'm a rising senior in computer engineering, and my area of expertise for this project is web development. So I've been working on both the user interface as well as the back end of the site, which involves authenticating users, creating a queue, and of course, sending commands from our website to our device via the Microsoft Azure IoT Hub. Hi, I'm Alex Paddock. I'm a senior computer engineering major, and I'm working on programming the project's microcontroller to talk to the cloud and handle user instructions. sophomore and a computer engineering major and as a part of the COVID-19 EC response team I've been working on the communications aspect of the project and also the application of Azure's digital twins technology to future projects and labs. Hi, my name is Pratulia Shepler. I'm a resident junior computer engineering major and I was tasked with working on the live streaming solution for this project. Hello everyone, my name is Ibrahim Khan and I'm a rising junior computer engineering major and I'm a front-end developer on this project. My responsibilities include making the UI, designing the UI, designing the user experience and coding everything on the front end. Thank you. Very good, thank you very much. Now this is going to... Okay. Okay. They're all going to talk at the same time, that's okay. <laughs> but still get there. <laughs> okay, so here's the setup. Uh, I hope that you're still with me. So here's the setup. Oops, it went too far. Okay, so here's the setup. Uh, the idea is really quite straightforward. We wanted to do something quite uh, quite simple, and yet it, it, it has some mechanical systems in it, some control systems. And so the goal is to simply move this object, this, this uh, three object in, 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 in two-dimensional space, in the x-axis and the y-axis, rather precisely using stepper motors with an encoder in them. And so uh, the idea is for students uh, remotely to be able to control this. And at the same time, we have ultrasonic distance sensors here that allows one to measure the x-axis distance and the y-axis distance. All of this stuff is uh, 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 streamed live in a video. So this is an example of this. Is, this is actually the system. And uh, I am going to then ask uh, one of the students, uh, uh, this equipment actually resides in, in, in one of our students' basements. And so I'd like to ask Kang if he can share, uh, he can share the screen. So I, I hope this works because, okay. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you, yes. You can hear me. Um, I don't have permission to share my screen. 
Uh, how do you, uh, okay, is there a way to, uh, okay, uh, there you go, we can see it, okay. Can you like pin my video then? You yes, can see? yes, it's there, thank you. Okay, you can see it? Okay, yes. so uh, the system's pretty simple. Um, right now, we just have uh, these two here. Uh, that one's pointing in this direction, and then the one on the bottom's pointing in the, back, the bottom direction, and that's the sensors. And uh, these switches here and there, are the limit switches so even if you have uh, inputs that are too big um, it will just physically stop it and then you know, these are the, the, the limit switches for the other axis and then these guys here are the stepper motors and the encoder combo um, that keeps track of your position um, and then for bonus we have this guy here it's a portable oscilloscope and uh, since everything's been remote we um, as I've been coding with Alex, uh, that's how I've been kind of troubleshooting things together. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kang. Uh, so, uh, so as you can see, uh, we actually developed this project also remotely. So everything about this little exercise really was a test on how can we operate, how can we do things that are meaningful, even though we are physically distributed. And we've learned quite a bit. So that's the story. Now, let me just tell you, let me just now uh, go on to the site that I said, please uh, 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 memorize. Uh, some of you, if you open the site, I, actually, I don't know if there had been anybody who, uh, who uh, was able to uh, see the sites at all. Uh, if uh, I'm going to have you know, maybe about five, uh, uh, I, I don't see all of the people here, but, uh, but uh, if, if no one I don't know if there's anyone who was able to access uh, it, but please, uh, you can enjoy this later on. So I'm going to have, um, uh, I guess, one of the students of, of uh, Protulia. Uh, one of the students is actually going to show you in real time what this, uh, this thing is able to do. So the bottom line is the following. The, this website, oh, let me go to the next uh, page, okay. That website, there are two websites. The one is a straightforward YouTube video, and you're just going to see something in real time. And when you execute something on the left side, that's the control panel. We call them Gizmo One. If you do this, uh, uh, when you first log in, it'll say entered in the queue, it'll ask you for your credentials. It's going to get recorded. And once that's done, it's going to give you a very simple window that basically asks you to do X or Y. And then, uh, and then, as soon as you hit submit, it will, uh, it will actually move this. And the cool thing about this is that you might be halfway across the world, uh, the, the globe, and still be able to do this, and it's still got the five-second delay. So uh, if that's uh, if that's um, uh, uh, if that's if 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 if, uh, if Pratulia is available, Pratulia, are you there? Oh uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, so could you please give us uh, a demonstration, a, re a real-time demonstration of this? Um, unfortunately, you know, it looks like the host is disabled screen sharing. So yeah, you, you, I don't know what else uh, to do, but uh, uh, um, uh, let's see. Uh, all participants. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Go ahead. All right then. It should be okay. All right. Good. All right, so um, I've already uh, entered in one command here. Um, I, I set the X and Y coordinates both to 100. Okay. And um, if we look at the, at the live stream video here, we can see that um, the apparatus has uh, moved to those coordinates. And now for the sake of simplicity, we'll do minus 100, minus 100, and hit submit. Very nice. And let's say if we wanted to do something a little bit more complex. Okay, while, um, while uh, Pratulia is uh, filling in this blank here, you might notice down uh, after below submit, it says use JSON format. What it is, is that instead of typing these pairs of numbers individually, you can actually just define an array and actually have that array, uh, submit that array, and it's going to execute that with, uh, with um, a high degree of accuracy. 
the number uh, right now, it is uh, about 256 different steps. So if you wanted to draw, if you wanted to create your signature, if you wanted to do whatever it is that you wanted to do within 256 lines of, uh, of commands, then it should, it should work. So right now, uh, Patrulia has got what? Uh, three, six, eight, let's see what it does. Okay, that one, it goes down. Uh-huh, it goes up, goes there. Okay, all right, okay, all right. So for those of you who, uh, well, you probably obviously see that, uh, you saw that that's the letter M. Uh, for uh, Mel, I mean, I'm sorry, for Marilyn. So we could do all sorts of things with this uh, and you can play. So I guess you can go and, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, use the site. It's going to remain uh, available for everybody. I think that uh, you should uh, try to do that uh, with your children or uh, uh, grandchildren. Uh, so then I am going to now stop the participant share and I am going to share my own. I'm going to go back. So, um, so that's the that's the that's really the story. But now let's look at what's underneath the hood. That's very important. Ah, by the way, these are sample inputs. This was the M that Pratulia created. This one here, look at this. It's increment one hundred four times, which means that this thing is going to go to the right four times and go back to uh, uh, to the left four times. But this is up down up down up down. So you you can imagine that this is going to generate a triangular wave. Uh, back, uh, backwards and forwards. Okay, so now what's the hood? I mean, the reason why I, I like to share this is that the whole, the, 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 the whole, uh, with the hopes that you know this could be emulated in our, our current setup. So now we have. Uh, I'm going to talk about the system level, hardware, the board, and cloud uh, computing. So uh, uh, Alex uh, is the uh, is the uh, main uh, developer of the system level design. So I'd like to give him a few uh, uh, seconds to explain the le uh, system level design. Alex, are you there? Yep. So uh, users, in the same way as the demo that we had just shown, interact with the system in two points, the YouTube live stream and the web app, which is hosted using the Heroku uh, service. The website is the main interface for the device, displaying data and allowing authenticated users to control it. Data from this site is then sent through the Azure IoT hub. And on the other end is the ESP32 microcontroller, which can parse data from Azure to produce effects in this connected hardware. The sensor data is then sent back through the Azure hub to be displayed on the site in regular intervals. And users can, of course, view all of this in action on the live stream. Excellent. Excellent. So it is actually bi-directional. It is very important to understand that we have a bi-directional communication from the client to the device and back from the device to the client. And that's very important. So here are some of the hardware components. I don't want to belabor this point, but these are very inexpensive uh, devices. Stepper motors, rotary encoders, distance sensors, uh, a bi-directional logic shifter just to uh, uh, make sure that the the logic levels are the same from 3.3 to 5, and we have the ESP32 board. Uh, altogether, it costs uh, us uh, less than maybe about 50 to 75 dollars for all of these hardware components, which is actually very cheap. Uh, let me mention something about the ESP32. Uh, Ken, you wanted to say a few words about ESP32? Okay, so Ken is currently not, but ESP. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Sorry, I just said that myself. Okay. Um, so the ESP32, um, I'm sure you guys all know about the very easily usable Arduino. Um, the ESP32 is actually cheaper um, and more powerful. It has two cores instead of the one core that Arduino has. And every IO pin that you can use can be also used as a hardware interrupt, which makes it a lot more uh, you can make a lot more interesting things, and it just has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in. Excellent, thank you. The one thing that I, have, I am particularly impressed with this ESP32 is the it's got a 12-bit uh, uh, A to D converter. Now, for those of you who are not uh, geeks, it really means that you can actually measure voltages down to the level of very, very small levels on the order of uh, several hundred microvolts, which is just slightly above noise level. It's also quite inexpensive. Uh, the thing costs about $15. I'm sure it's gonna get much, much cheaper as more, as more people use this. 
So again, moving on. So what about communications to the cloud? So uh, 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 um, Michael is the one responsible for this communication. So please, Michael, explain to us what's going on here. Yeah, so Alex touched on this a bit, but basically the Azure IoT Hub uh, controls all the functions on the device pretty easily. It can uh, call any function that we upload to the device uh, from the cloud. And the way users interface with that is through our website that's hosted on Heroku right now. And that's, um, that's where the form is, that's where it keeps the queue uh, and all the controls for the IoT Hub. And that also uses this um, database down here to authenticate and store users and sessions. And I'll talk more about the website on the next slide. So I'd like to add uh, that the reason why we are doing this in this using the hub in the cloud is because we design it so it is massively deployable. The idea of controlling an instrument remotely is not, is, 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 is rather trivial. You can use something like a VPN, control somebody else's computer or your own. That's not so difficult and the technology to do that is actually very, very simple. What this makes it more, more difficult is how are you going to have a massive deployment when you have, let's say, hundreds, if not thousands of people trying to access the site. You need to authenticate every single one of them for security reasons, and you need to store everything that they have put in there. So in other words, if you were a professor and you needed some assignments to do, they can create things on that. You can, they can do activities on the, on the device, have it be recorded, and it'll be, it'll be visible because it is stored. And this thing is massively deployable. It could do thousands at the same time. That's the value of having to go to the cloud. So then, so the software part. Yeah, so the website itself is written in full stack JavaScript, but really it can be written in uh, any language you'd like. And the way it works is as soon as you log in, it authenticates with Google right now and it stores the user and their session in the database so that we can keep a queue. So we only have one user controlling the device at a single time. And it uses WebSockets to update all the users about their place in the queue. And also it sends data from the ultrasonic sensor on the device so we can display a pretty graph on the front end. Excellent. So uh, this concept of front end and back end development is a buzzword in cloud computing. The MERN stack is one of the several series of stacks that you could use, and this is particularly useful for this kind of application. Express uh, 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 JavaScript is, I think, developed by Facebook, and this is responsible for the front end. That's the one that the clients see on their, uh, 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 on their uh, computers. And Mongo Node is the back end. That's actually the, the devices on the device side, something along these lines, but that is an important part of of the development is the front end or so-called full stack uh, development. Okay, so I, uh, I think that, uh, that uh, we have uh, touched uh, upon uh, the demonstration and uh, also uh, some of the things underneath the hood. I wanted to now move on to uh, kind of a, a little bit broader perspective. Uh, it's been a while since, uh, it's been a while since I, I, I went to school in, in, in UP and I, I, I don't remember many of the experiments now, but I still remember that there are quite a bit of experiments that, uh, that you could do using this digital technology. Now, we can actually do things that are very, very sophisticated. Uh, remember that we have 48 input out, out, output pins that we can use, okay? The system that we have right now is 17. We use 17 pins, not even half of the pins were used. And so we can actually have far more sophisticated processes to be able to implement in labs in various, vari various fields. So in physics, we can go springs and pendulums, oscillations, optics and inter interferometry, anything that you can control and actuate using electricity. That's really all you need. Now you have chemistry, biology, environmental sensing, earthquake, landslide sensing, control loops, and of course, in many other engineering fields, uh, civil, aerospace, uh, uh, bio, look, it is just, it just requires a little bit of imagination. 
And so this is what I wanted to impart to the audience uh, right now. I, I'm hoping that, that we have shown you enough and we have shown you how really uncomplicated it is to develop our own. This, I believe, is particularly suitable in the Philippine setting. Why? The hardware is inexpensive. The software licensing and cloud ser services are reasonably affordable. Right now, for us, it's, it's free because, you know, students. But I think it'll cost around the order of about $25 a month to host something and, uh, and use the Azure for, uh, <coughs> for universities. So it's very cheap. But we do need a few things. We need to develop competency among our STEM and engineering majors. We really need to make them be aware that computer science is just not the computer thing that you have in your, in your laptop or your, or your mainframe. It has to include cloud computing. And the next generation of programmers are the ones who understand how to program in the cloud, full stack developers particularly. Now, how do we do that in, in engineering? Well, we have in, 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 at the University in the Philippines, we have five year engineering. What the, 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 the final year is what we call the thesis project. In the United States, we call it capstone. Well, professors, why can't we assign projects that are like this with a specific purpose of deploying it to lots and lots of high schools and lots and lots of people in the, in the Philippines? That would be awesome. I also think that our schools and universities should really collaborate amongst each other. Uh, La Salle might uh, have a set of labs that they are, you know, famous for, and they could share those resources with students from other universities, UP, Athena, et cetera, right? And other places might have expertise. And so it's just a matter of really sharing resources. These things, as I said, are massively deployable and they can handle lots and lots of loads. So it is something that we could, uh, we could uh, use in a very collaborative fashion in the Philippines. Now, with anything else, I mean, despite the fact that this is inexpensive, we need money to do it. I think we already have the talent and the skill uh, in the Philippines, but we do need the money uh, to, to develop it. And I hope that there are members in the audience uh, who are uh, in the leadership position to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to support projects like this, because I think this is essential uh, for, uh, towards the, the advancement of, uh, of, the, of the Philippines. We should not be left behind too much. A lot of countries already are doing this uh, intensively, uh, Australia, China, Korea, Taiwan, and we should get in the action as well. So let me conclude, my time is up. We be I believe that we have a real opportunity to make an impact on science and engineering education and research. This reminds me way back when, uh, when we started uh, VISOR in the Philippines. This is the Versatile Instrumentation Research for Science, Education, and, and Research. Versatile uh, uh, system. And it's right now, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, doing very well, my understanding, at NIP under the, the guidance of, uh, of uh, Dean Papa. Anyway, I think that we can leverage the power of the Internet of Things really to create a change, a paradigm shift in offering modern experien experiential training delivery, new labs. So COVID had, been brought, had brought us disaster. <laughs> it looks like COVID, uh, to me anyway, it looks like you know, I was placed in the side of the building with COVID. I mean, the side of the mountain, right? I didn't know what to go. But here's my thought. We should not really worry about falling off the cliff, okay? Instead, we should focus on how to get to the top. This is a paradigm shift. This is something that we could do, and we have reason to do it. And therefore, I believe we should do it. Okay, having said that, I think my time is up, and I am simply going to uh, quit now and, uh, and, uh, and wave... Uh, and wave uh, a goodbye. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, uh, Mel, for the excellent, you know. I should have proposed to Giselle, Giselle, this session should have been for five hours, you know. I just couldn't <laughs> stop uh, Mel, uh, you know, speaking. And of course, 
Of course, uh, Raymond, uh, had you been, uh, you know, a, a non-pre-recorded lecture, you could have also, I could have also stopped you okay. from, from speaking, uh, you know. Excellent talks, uh, you know, to follow uh, Dr. Juice's uh, lecture, you know, earlier. Now uh, we are open for the question and answer. So uh, can I have uh, the question uh, from, the, from the floor? Okay. Uh, let me uh, read to you. Uh, the question for Raymond Tan uh, from Hill Men Mendoza. It seems to me that the P-graph network can be optimized using the branch and bound algorithm. I think you may have done this. Can you give us a sense of the size of the network optimized by accelerated branch and bound? MSG to me looks like it uh, uh, too can be optimized beyond identifying superstructure using combinatorial algorithms or rules. If you have done this, can you give us a sense of the amount of complexity, uh, complexity of the combinatorial rules used? If the fuzzy MILP is an appropriate algorithm to use, on the use of AI, have you considered using random forest or boosted decision trees? Raymond? Right. Uh, thank you, Hill, for your, I think I can read uh, four or five questions in there, and I'll try to make this really quick and economical. First, regarding optimization, the standard PNS problem is a special class of MILP problems. Those, as you know, are solved using a standard branch and bound. And uh, PGRAPH is based on the, because PNS problems are a special class of MILPs with additional information. That additional information can be used to accelerate the branch and bound optimization and reach solutions faster because of uh, properties of the PNS problem, which I can't go into that in very much detail. Your second question, which I'll try to take up in conjunction with a later question that I can see on screen regarding cursive dimensionality. Uh, I just speak of a recent example by the powerhouse research team at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, just by way of background, this PSE team in CMU traditionally has subscribed to a different school of thought from PGRAPH. So they would be the last people we would expect to use PGRAPH. There was a paper from their group published in 2018 where they were trying to look at chemical reaction networks. Uh, and what happened was they could see the net observable reaction and they were trying to deduce, deduce the individual reaction steps and what are the possible true reactions taking place on a stepwise basis. And initially, they were looking at 30 billion, uh, that's 10 raised to 9, 30 billion alternative reactions in their project. And I can imagine this would have been very stressful for the PhD student who was doing the analysis. But eventually, they used PGRAPH and scaled it down and pruned the uh, scale down the search and they found 70 or so potential chemical reactions and eliminating billions of others from further consideration. So that's a practical example of how you can really scale down problem size. And I think it speaks to Juice's question as well. Now I'm interested in your last question because you speak of AI and it was in October of 2019 that I started to speculate. I remember I was having dinner with a friend in Rome, and uh, I asked, uh, you think we can use PGRAPH for artificial intelligence applications? And it took about eight months of gestation. I'm happy to note now, even though I'm going out on a limb, I'm working with two colleagues from La Salle, uh, Angeline Lau, who's a mathematician, and Kathleen Aviso, who's had extensive work in PGRAPH. And we're going to use PGRAPH for AI applications. And the closest analog that we can find is something called fuzzy combination. Uh, Raymond, 
Uh, Mel, you can retire early. There's so much job to be done in the Philippines. You can do it remotely, you know. Uh, <laughs> very much, uh, you know, uh, important for our, uh, you know, elementary, high school, and even at the tertiary levels. I think a lot. Your advisor, you have to extend it, uh, you know, uh, really, to be honest. So anyway, uh, any question on the floor for, for Mel? Uh, while uh, we reconnect uh, to uh, you know to to Raymond later on. Okay, from Giselle Concepcion, uh, Mel, can you tell us a bit about how to interface Viser with this online lab education? Uh, in a way, yes. It's 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 really just about uh, technology. See, what we're doing with Viser uh, is we've got these uh, these instruments that we adapted for science education, right? And so we're using the core, a microprocessor that essentially has this input outputs that control things and measure things. The difference now is this is actually a minor step, which is now to develop devices that not only measure things locally, but they can actually talk to the cloud. What does that mean? You now have, you should have devices that have communication systems such as Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth, uh, Laura Wan, these things. So it now the good thing about this is when we started Visor, chips with built-in communication systems were not available. Now the technology has uh, advanced significantly that you can get. Look at this; it's fifteen dollars at today's prices uh, for something that is twice or three times as powerful as the old stuff. So we can still actually do this. So all of the products that we have at Visor. It's just converting them as it is, converting them into something that we could uh, use in the cloud. So then students in the provinces do not need to go and buy this equipment, right? They simply have to go to the, I don't know, uh, the high school or, or, or the central high school or, or the barangay halls or something like that, that they have this thing. And so they just maybe play, play with them using their cell phones or whatever, or laptops. So, in some sense, uh, in some sense, the visor can actually. This is what I would like to call it, visor two. So this is the next generation of uh, of uh, of uh, distributed uh, uh, science uh, science experiments. Okay, uh, thank you, Mel, uh, for that. Um, okay, let me read uh, just some uh, comments uh, here from. Uh, I think uh, Raimundo Asuncion has one. Let me just read it. Uh, where is it? Uh, I'm losing it. Uh, oh, Raymond is back. Uh, Raymond, uh, sorry. Uh, let me... Oh, okay. Can someone put off... Uh, Sorry. So I guess, I guess, uh, can you hear me? I have the chat. Yes, Mel. Yes, yes, Mel. Sorry. So uh, you mentioned uh, Sean. No? Hello, Sean. So I'm going to read. Thanks for sharing what are you espousing on collaborating. Yes. It's exactly what we're doing in the field of microbiology. Uh, we have established a consortium, different universities collaborating to come up with online common level. Well, I don't know much about <laughs> microbiology, uh, Sean. But I believe that if you've got systems over there that you can actually measure using voltages, you know, voltmeters, or you can have processes that you can actuate remotely. In other words, if you've got processes that you can replace your hands with machines, then that's it. You could do these experiments without any problem at all. 
Now, in, uh, in, 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 in microbiology, uh, I think you would probably have, uh, oh, I think this is actually very interesting because you might have to develop something like this in the field of robotics, where you now have systems, these remote systems that are actually capable of manipulating things, not only stepper motors, but things like bottles and you know, things that will shake and, and you can change all of that. That is a very sophisticated system, but it is something that I think can be done using this, this process. But the bottom line is if you have, I think it's a case-to-case -case basis, look at all the experiments that you have and you ask yourself, Pwede pa tong gawin ng, can, it, can it be done remotely? Do I have to have a physical presence in there? Kung hindi, that's okay. Then you can do it. You know? So, uh, so uh, I remember the, the story of uh, Luli Cruz and when they were talking about, you know, how they were measuring the effect of the conotoxin on the mice. As I remember, they, they were saying that they would invert the cage and they would count the number of, 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 of mice uh, dropping down and they get the statistics and they got what they need. Well, something like this could actually do this. Uh, in fact, this is a rhetorical question in one of my discussions with my, with my, with my, uh, with my team. So what it is, is you have a cage with mice so natutulog sila. Kung hindi sila natutulog, they're floating around. So you just have a device that will turn this cage around. So the, so the mice that are conscious will probably go and climb up. And do also, the ones that are not conscious are probably going to stay in the bottom. And that's something so easy to do with, I don't know, with either uh, um, uh, 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 computer vision or, or something. Remember, you have a means to look at it. You have the video, you have the YouTube video. And with YouTube video is the data. And you can do uh, uh, image processing to figure out who's sleeping and who's not. But the whole point of turning the, the cage, well, that's something you could do remotely. So you can do all sorts of things like, uh, like this. So another example is I wanted to know, you know how much the mungo grows every day. I don't need to be there all the time. I just have a video to take a look at it, maybe time-lapse photography. And then I will put in a system where I'm going to put a little bit of whatever soil, I mean, soil, uh, uh, moisture, uh, I mean, water, when I see that the moisture is low. All of these things are actually done already. The one thing that we are proposing here is that we do it in a massive scale. That's all. So, so that's, the, that's, the kind okay. of, uh, that's the kind of nebulous idea that I'm trying to propose here. Okay. Thank you, Mel. I know it's worth, uh, you know, an extension for an hour. Uh, you see, <laughs> rarely we can have these excellent speakers, you know, together. So uh, this is now beyond the script. We wanted to end at exactly 10 o'clock as what we have planned, but I'm happy and uh, Paas is happy to extend uh, with our, uh, you know, uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, let me just have one more question for you, Mel, before we go back to, uh, to Raymond. Mm -hmm from Riza Linda De Leon. Uh, thank you, Mel, for the great presentation, which I found very informative, especially since UPD Chemical Engineering Department will be developing remote-controlled chemical engineering lab experiments in collaboration with the Electrical and Electrochemical Engineering Institute. While such setups would be accessible for those who have good internet and devices, what would you suggest for students who are beyond internet reach? That's a that's the you know sixty four thousand dollar question. Look, um, we can only <laughs> give it to you in retail. Because eh. this technology really relies on on internet connectivity. So we can offer this as long as you have internet uh, connectivity. It's like it's like oxygen. It's very hard to implement anything for people that may not have oxygen in them. I'm, I'm sorry to. To have such a drastic uh, 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 analogy, but it is what it is that we need them in order for them to access. We need the backbone. We need internet, the Wi-Fi. On the other hand, let me uh, turn the table a little bit. You can actually do experiments that you do not need. Uh, let's say out in the field, you can do experiments out in the field without internet connectivity. How? Well, there are these other channels of uh, long range communication. It's like the, the, the frequencies, different frequencies. 
No, I'm not suggesting that we grab the uh, the frequencies of ABS-CBN. No, that's not my not my, not my suggestion. All I'm saying is there there are these frequencies uh, available so that people actually can use devices that can communicate. They're low bandwidth, but they're pretty good in communicating uh, uh, data. Let's say out in the field, in the forest, and down to a central location about five kilometers away, you can do all of that. Uh, so, so uh, uh, without any internet, we can also use the uh, the GSM or the or the LTE uh, or the or the five G system. Uh, ultimately, I'm sure it's going to happen. Not yet in our not yet in the uh, in the in the in the foreseeable future. But as soon as we get the infrastructure of the phone, if we can have a phone, we can actually do all, do all of this stuff. In fact, the phone system, if we have the the uh, 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 good bandwidth uh, brought about by the next generation. We don't need the Wi-Fi at all, so we can access everyone. But for now, uh, Dean, uh, it is what it is. Uh, kailangan, we really need internet connectivity sa ngayon. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mel. On that note, let us move uh, uh, to Raymond uh, again. Uh, he's back. Uh, Richmond, can we show... Uh, uh, questions for Raymond, please. Uh, okay, let me read uh, the one coming from Michael, uh, Mike Romintilia. Um, I think this has not been uh, read, correct? Anyway, thanks for this informative presentation. My right. interest to apply such tool in multi-hazard risk management. Can you imagine a future P-graph application in this problem domain? If yes, what could be the potential limitations of this method to the robust uh, in such or robustness in such application? Uh, Raymond? Hey, thanks for that question, Mike. I think before I got cut off, I was describing that I'm developing the theoretical aspect of the work on uh, a special class of cognitive maps with two colleagues from La Salle. Uh, what I've been thinking about also is applying that to a current problem, which is COVID-19. And very quickly, let me describe the problem. The problem with human expertise is it comes in pockets. So you would have, for example, uh, people who specialize in viruses or epidemiology being concerned and being knowledgeable about the specific aspect of the problem. And on the other hand, you would have uh, economists and sociologists understanding different aspects of the problem. And uh, there is, of course, a human tendency to look at a complex and wicked problem from the lens that you're comfortable with. And thus, economists would fail perhaps to understand the full uh, hazards of a disease like this, and conversely, people who work with diseases may not grasp the full economic implications. ICP graph essentially as a network assembly algorithm. It's a bit like having pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, which you can then assemble automatically with, with an algorithm, and this is what we're looking to do, that those pockets of knowledge and uh, uh, sub-networks of understanding how things work within certain disciplines can be assembled into a larger network so you get a better grasp of what the problem looks like from the grand scale and from different disciplinal perspectives and perhaps you'll be able to come up with better solutions to you know things like balancing loss of life with this pandemic thank you for that okay raymond Let's have uh, another question from Juice Santos. What are the similarities and perhaps strengths of a P graph over stock and flow model used in system dynamics modeling? Also, how does a P graph handle the so called curse of dimensionality? I could imagine complex systems with a large scale and highly interdependent. Raymond? Raymond, you're still there. Uh, okay. Um, anyway, we can pass uh, on that question to him and uh, he can actually share 
is answered. You know, so uh, we are very much indeed, uh, uh, you know, uh, happy to have been graced by so many uh, personalities uh, in this uh, particular session. Uh, our academics, uh, researchers, from the industry, government. This has uh, generated a lot of interest. Uh, perhaps because this is a plenary session about uh, you know technology, but in the meantime, I see I'm seeing Raymond uh, back here. Raymond, can you just uh, answer a question from Juice uh, Santos, please? Thank you. Uh, did you get uh, Did you get the question or uh, Richmond? Can I have again the question from uh, Juice? Um, Raymond is there. What are the simil similarities and perhaps strengths of PGraph over stack and flow model used in system dynamic modeling? Also, how does PGraph handle the so-called curse of dimensionality? I could imagine complex systems with large scale and highly interdependent. Raymond. Okay, we lost Raymond again. Uh, Juice, I thought we're done with your disaster. Uh, you know, I was about to to end that the saying we have, you know, we have actually uh, got away with with disaster. You know, but it seems like your question seems to not, uh, you know, to not get the response from Raymond. Uh, never mind. Uh, I think uh, in the interest of time, can we? Uh, uh, we have received a number of. Uh, you know, messages for our two, uh, you know, speakers, uh, several, uh, you know, commendations coming uh, from our participants uh, for Raymond and, and uh, Mel, excellent demo, fantastic, uh, you know, Mel, amazing. Uh, this app can be used uh, in interactive virtual teaching and learning, some fun, great app, uh, you know, great ideas. Uh, I know it's, you know, there's just a host of, uh, you. you know, uh, great talk, Mel. Very engineering talks, uh, indeed. Uh, I gained, uh, learned a lot from, uh, of new knowledge from this uh, uh, webinar. Excellent talks. Uh, thank you. Thanks for all speakers for a great session. Great talks. Thanks. Thank you, Raymond, um, Mel. Uh, you know, uh, thanks everyone. Nice to some see familiar names in the attendees. Uh, okay, so under a lot of, we will uh, send that uh, to you, uh, you know. So uh, indeed, this has been an amazing morning uh, for everyone. Uh, excellent talks uh, from our co-lectureship awardees from the 2020 to the 2017 and the 20, uh, you know, 08. You know, put them together uh, a two hour you know, uh, time would not be in Lydia now. So um, let me just uh, uh, give uh, some, uh, you know, uh, reminders. Um, uh, on behalf of uh, our board chair of PAASE, um, Carlito Libri uh, Librilia, with all the happenings, including the excellent lectures at the 40th APAMS, it's time to remind you our members of PAASE and those prospective members to uh, have your membership juice in. PAASE, you know, uh, welcomes donations and we rely on the membership fees. They will be used to fund exciting APAMS meetings and the general operation of the academy. You can check our website uh, at uh, www.paase.org. Uh, you know, membership uh, fees for lifetime uh, membership, that's 4,000 pesos. Otherwise, uh, that's a yearly 1,000 uh, for members, outside members, uh, uh, you know, coming out of the, uh, outside the Philippines. That's a lifetime membership of 400 US dollars with their yearly dues. If you are not paying the lifetime fee, uh, that would be $50 per year. So I would like to encourage our colleagues, uh, members of the PAASE and those prospective members to support, uh, you know, financially and we welcome donations uh, so that we can actually be able to sustain our 
voluntary efforts, uh, you know, in bringing science uh, to the masses, to the people. And of course, this is a science for change. And we are fortunate to have members of the PASE from the US and all over the world uh, connecting with the Filipino scientists uh, here uh, and bring, uh, you know, science closer to, to the people and uh, to everyone. So um, this has been really a great day. I would like to, to thank again our uh, uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, maybe you can show your videos, Juice, um, uh, Raymond and Mel. Of course, uh, this is your plenary session two of the 40th Paase anniversary celebration. Uh, this is your uh, 2020th APAMS. Giselle is there with our PAASE uh, president and the host of our members in the US who are actually staying late now. I know in the Eastern it's uh, time, it's uh, over 10 o'clock in the evening. And I know this is worth the wait. Would like to thank Carlito uh, and uh, everyone, uh, you know, for uh, sharing your time. Giselle, our PAASE president. And behind all this, we would like to acknowledge, you know, the services of Mitchell Richmond Pancho, who has been, uh, you know, staying very late and early morning, has to wake up, you know, to make sure that all the technical details and the logistical requirements for these APAMs that will run until August 14 will run smoothly. So we cannot say any more, uh, uh, you know, other than thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Juice. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, thank you, Mel. And all our participants who have stayed late, uh, you know, in the morning and late in the evening for this wonderful opportunity, you know. So we will continue to uh, engage ourselves, uh, you know, not only during this uh, APAMS uh, event, but in our daily, uh, uh, you know, uh, activities as we are faced with the challenges of this COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, Mel, you have done a lot of ideas and how we can, uh, you know, address uh, this uh, productivity and delivering education, especially under these uh, circumstances. And to uh, our industry participants, you have benefited a lot from Raymond's talk on uh, the use of PGRAPH and process, you know, and of course, for our uh, Philippines always uh, faced with disasters and with this pandemic, we have Ju Santos uh, given an excellent idea on how uh, novel uh, you know, models can be used uh, you know, to help our decision makers and our researchers. So again, thank you so much. This is Alvin Kulaba, your host for today. And now we would like to end the session. Thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow uh, for another exciting three parallel sessions. And maybe, Mon, you can just uh, quickly show it. Uh, we have uh, uh, another uh, session tomorrow as we continue APAMS 2020 with uh, three parallel, uh, you know, exciting sessions to be chaired by several distinguished also scientists uh, from the Philippines and all over the world. So now it starts at eight o'clock, uh, runs through maybe 10 to 11 in the morning. Keep up in your schedule and you know another engaging morning uh, and evening from the US uh, tomorrow. That's all for today. Thank you and good morning and good night uh, to the US. Thank you and adieu. Thanks everyone. Group, uh, uh, okay. We have taken uh, the photos anyway. So, uh, or those who are stay, still there, maybe you can put on your video. We're taking a photo up uh, on screen. So, whenever uh, you get the chance to put your video on, please do. We're going to go through, there are about three pages of this or four pages of this. Uh, Richmond, please uh, help me uh, take the photo, please. Okay. So, that's the first. Uh, okay. Request everyone to please turn on their webcams, their video, please. Thank you. Okay. Please turn in your video, please, uh, just to show your live uh, faces. Okay. So thank you. That's uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll rest. <laughs> Friends and colleagues, nice to see you. Uh,
virtually, you know, it's been a long while. Uh, you know, we have uh, not seen each other. Okay. So Richmond, just take photos for each page. All right. Uh, you know, it's, uh, this will be part of our historic celebration of uh, Paas's 40th year. So again, thank you so much. Uh, we'll see you again uh, tomorrow and the uh, succeeding uh, sessions until August 14 of this year. Thank you so much and God bless. Good job, Alvin. Thank you. Good job, Mel. <laughs> Al, Al, you got my message, right? Yeah, you something. got it. Let's talk about it. I mean, come yep, on. Yep, yep. Kaya, kaya, yeah, we can do this. Kaya natin yan. Yeah. <laughs> maraming, maraming pera si Al, Mel. Let's not have a competition muna. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Pera si Al. Al, kailangan mo na ikutos na yung pera. You already yes. have to pound it. Now is the time to put it out. Yes, I'll yeah, get your money out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the may dalawa, may dalawa lang kumagat. Si Vision at saka si Baby Lynn. Ayun, kumagat na. So, okay. That's good, that's good. Right. That's good. And then we can okay, we can do as you since guys, pasok. <laughs> oh, yeah. Giselle, thank you so much. A great session. Yeah, excellent, so excellent. So Mel. So, Mel, uh, I'm is... forward. Really, uh, Visor too. You're you're really a frontier. Oh well. Yes. I, 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 yeah, Implement it. Yes. Uh oh. Yeah, marami tayo. Uh, yeah, marami tayo ng pepedi implement don. I will uh, try and. Uh, Say so, talaga yung major concern natin. Major concern uh, for sa STEM, even at the undergraduate level, yung lab laboratory training. Mahirap oh. sa biology. Ah, uh, mahirap sa ano? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mel, uh, retire early. Will assure you your, uh, you know, sustained uh, income. There's just so much we can do here in the Philippines. Yeah, sama ka na Mel. Yeah, balik ka na. Well, he can wanted, always do that in the U.S. I, I wanted to, but they're not allowing people from America to come to the U.S. No, it's okay. Yeah, just manage it from there. Uh, we're okay. It's 14 you know, days. Great. Quarantine ka. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'll create yeah. a bubble for you. I'll we'll escort you to the airport. <laughs> Uh, you, yes. So, hindi naka-attend si Ganita Pang Mel, pero I was in constant uh, communication with him. But I, I think uh, itong, itong, uh, can, can people kind of uh, view the talks again? Uh, oh, ba? yeah. It's yes, recorded. yes, yes, Mel. It's recorded. Oh, para, oh, para lang, it's recorded. Know. And uh, we have a YouTube recording as well. So, we are going to share it. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Richmond. Mga, mga, mga schools, kasi oh yes, you know, sure. You know, kasi yung yung capstone design, yung 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 thesis nila. You mm -hmm. know, you come up with some sort of ano. Tapos itong si Al, uh, we have a little bit of. <laughs> no, we Mel, give him. You see, see him, kailangan bigyan natin sila ng resources. Kaya five hundred dollars. Oh, yeah, Mel, you seem to have accepted uh, our invitation that you retire uh, and then continue <laughs> your work for us. <laughs> Well, we, well, we have so much to do for our education here in the country. So, uh, hey. Mel, you will not be out of job for sure. So, I'll, myself, Giselle, we will be behind you. So, no problem. You need one. The universities, we will, we will mobilize them, uh, you know. I, I've just uh, sent your, uh, your uh, slides, uh, Mel, to uh, Sec Boy de La Peña. See? Oh, yes. Din, eh, ba? Din, you know. That you Saka, eventually, the Mel, the private sector, the private sector oh. uh, sponsors for the lab. So, I mean, mm -hmm. na ng perang about this, ten yan. million. Oh. Yeah. Then we can we can try it. we can try to get the Ayalas and everybody else. Well, to start yeah, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Moa with the Paasek. So that's your role, uh, actually, na uh, out. Right? Yes. Yeah, yes. We, need, we need specific projects yes. like this. Exactly. You can pitch to them, Giselle. Oh, yeah. Saan nyo okay. ba hini, humingi tayo ng pera? Saan natin gagamitin? Ito yun. Exactly. Mga Meron tayong group na ganyan, natin. Yeah. Meron tayong group discussion. Meron tayong yeah. group discussion led by uh, Gobet Advincula and Michael Purganan on STEM hmm. education. So, Mel, kailangan yeah. nandun yeah. sa panel. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Tapos kung yeah. bidahin mo, 
al yung mga private sector para mag-participate doon sa panel dis- sa group yeah. discussion. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, okay. get the private sector, especially yes. the free uh, PSP, you know, the foundations, you know, to listen to that STEM, you know. And there's so but much we need, we need, you know. Yeah. Alvin, we need mail. We need mail. Ideas <laughs> like this. Examples, we need no? mail there. <laughs> I, need, I need bullets, guys. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I know. Al, Al, if it's our faces that will be there, they might not give you know the money. So let's let's show mail space there. So so so. Ano sila sa pagbuong natin? Yes, yes, of course. Right, you know. No. Tapos now, Viser in the cloud. You know. Yes. The major. Yes. Mel, we have so much clouds in the Philippines every day. <laughs> Nimbus, what about what, what clouds do you want? You want to rename a new cloud? Yeah. So, yes, let's <laughs> utilize that's the future, it. Eh. That's the future, guys. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. really what we do. So, you know, matagal ko nang uh, try i-connect si Mel then kaila mm-hmm. Chris and Marivic Bernido kasi they are connected, they're fully supported by SMART. Okay, mm-hmm. tapos nag-umpisa sila siyempre sa uh, physics, learning physics as one, right? Dynamic learning for physics. Siyempre, yun ang medyo rin madali na uh, ituro nila sa kanilang uh, school, no? But uh, Mel and I think the Bernida should be connected. And then with that, connect with SMART, okay? So, I think uh, we have a good thing going yeah. to symbolize I- by the bridges. Yeah. Look at your yeah. uh, so Alvin, sana describe mo yes. yung bridges. San Juanico linked with the San Francisco. Ang ganda niya. Ang right. ganda, no? Yeah. So, sabi ni Perny Perny sa email natin, tawagin mm-hmm. natin ang Paase Solidarity or Paase Bayanihan. Si let okay. this symbolize Paase Solidarity uh, between the US and the Philippines. Or pa- pa- aser, okay. Maybe that will uh, culminate at the end, uh, Giselle. Yes. That's something that will, uh, uh, you know, be uh, that would bridge to the to the Paase 2021, when the right. uh, 40th yes. anniversary ultimate, uh, culminates in the U.S. Symbolic. So that bridge should complete, uh, you know, uh, from the Philippines to the U.S. It's so I think that would be your message, you know, so when we when we sa session that I hosted, sinabi ko, it's also the bridge between basic research. So, meron kaming speakers on molecular and cellular biology, top speakers. Tapos, it ended with speakers from UP Manila PGH. What's on the yes. ground there in uh, PGH? Yeah, right. Yung development ni Ewang, um, Dr. Wang, sa Sibol, medical devices, and also uh, Dr. Lapitan's uh, program on uh, infections after surgery monitoring surveillance yes actually this photo uh, you know speaks of so many things uh, you know the sea there the beautiful uh, you know sea and the so beautiful. you know so very uh, you know so i think this really uh, uh, you know provides a pathway uh, for the next maybe 40 or more years for paase so we happen. have been you know that's why uh, i think uh, giselle we really need to build, uh, you know, a group of people who will sustain, you know, our energy is not, uh, is not infinite. So we need a new breed of people who will continue. This has been what I try to do, Alvin. That's why we have 30 new um, hosts. So there are three <clears throat> parallel sessions and the hosts there are the ones that I thought would be our new leaders. Okay? Because, um, yes, you know, right. The- demonstrating that they can come up with their own uh, symposia, mini yeah. symposia. We have never been absent, Giselle. So right. we are still here. <laughs> no, no, no. You have to uh, pass so on. We are, well, you know, we, we, we are. That's why. To the new leader. You know? And yeah. then there so are let's... Now groups. We have groups based on yes. research expertise. At the same time, we can still be involved in the projects and the advocacies that we are interested sure. in. Sure, sure. So that's your whole idea of passe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, Mel? Mel? Mel, Mel uh, yeah. still, is still there. Mel is still there. 